92 to 93% of Americans are not metabolically well. That's crazy. Throw away the seed oil. The number one consumed fat in the United States is soybean oil. So what do most Americans do? They sit down and have their cornflakes with their skim milk and a glass of orange juice. And then an hour later, they have a pop tart or maybe a granola bar. I mean, they're just on this sugar roller coaster and they're never setting themselves up for success. Cynthia is an intermittent fasting expert, a nurse practitioner, and a seasoned veteran of clinical medicine. Having spent almost two decades in the ER and cardiology, after a serious health scare in 2019 that left her bedridden for 13 days. She turned to the power of nutrition to support her recovery, proving that food isn't just fuel, but medicine too. Sleep is critically important to our health, and that is not five hours of sleep with, you know, binging Netflix and, you know, being woken up because your, you know, neighbors are noisy. A lot of why we don't sleep well is self-induced. You know, we are on tablets, devices, blue light, watching TV. You know, we're stressed and on our computers in bed. Is intermittent fasting, is it hyped? I think many people are tired of counting calories. They know it doesn't work. Ultimately, the processed food industry will lose if people are eating less often, leading le eating less frequently. And when I always look at sponsored research, the question is always who benefits from saying that fasting isn't effective. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning educational publisher serving over a million students nationwide. If you're a kindergarten to eighth grade teacher or principal, be sure to check out our supplementary workbooks to get your students ready for standardized state testing. We cover all subjects from kindergarten to eighth grade. Use the coupon code AVENUE for a 25% discount off of all purchase orders. Visit us today at argoprep.com slash store. Cynthia, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to connecting with you both. Of course, it's an absolute pleasure. And uh, this is going to be super fun for me because, you know, I've kind of dabbled and learned a little bit about intermittent fasting. I think it's fair to say that this is extremely popular. I think we've at least all heard about it. But um, uh, it's it's it'll be great because now we get to kind of deep dive in and really uh, find out and learn more about intermittent fasting. So I kind of want to start off with talking about common misconceptions because that's 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 the fun part right can you share some common misconceptions that people have about if intermittent fasting yeah i would say it really starts with intermittent fasting is not starvation i think that in our kind of hairy culture where people tend to eat too frequently and eat too much that they perceive that this is a form of starvation and i have to remind everyone that it really is a eating less often methodology, and there's a time in which you eat and a time in which you do not eat. So it is absolutely not starvation, which is choosing not to eat at all. Um, I would also say that a, a lot of people believe that fasting is new or novel, and I like to remind them that fasting dates back to biblical times. So all the major religions have incorporated some degree of fasting into their practices, and it's just gotten more popular as an antidote to a lot of the recommendations that I myself at the beginning of my career provided indicating that you needed to eat to stoke your metabolism, that breakfast was the most important meal of the day. And it really speaks contrary to that. So in a lot mm. of different ways, I remind people that it is um, certainly something that people are more aware of now, but definitely not new or novel. It's really, it's been here for a long time. I would say those are probably the two most common misconceptions about fasting that I love dispelling myths around. Got it. And who who is this for? Is it for everybody? Is it for a specific uh, segment of the population? Um, I think that's a really important question. I would say that anyone that is still growing, so certainly children, teenagers, young adults, if they're still growing in terms of height, probably not the strategy to embrace. But for okay. most adults, unless they are pregnant or breastfeeding or are struggling with a recent hospitalization or chronically underweight, have an eating disorder, and that runs the gamut from binge eating to anorexia, bulimia. 
I think most other adults actually benefit from eating less frequently um, if they are otherwise, you know, healthy and a good mindset. But when we take the small subsect of the population that I'm referring to, that are not appropriate for fasting. Most other adults, even if they use 12 hours of digestive rest, really get profound benefits from not eating up until bed and eating. I think the the most recent study I looked at was individuals were eating six to 10 times a day and that's average. So there's people wow. that are eating more frequently than that. Um, almost all of us really benefit from a bit of giving ourselves a bit of digestive rest. And that may look a little different for each one of us, but uh, certainly a strategy that can be of benefit to most, if not all adults. But what about the size of the food? Six times a day, but what about the sizing of the food? It can be just one banana or they eating a lot. Right. Right. I mean, and that's a good point. I mean, snacking and eating a meal can be very different. But I think if you understand physiologically that most, if not all Americans, are not metabolically healthy. You know, the statistic prior to the pandemic was in 2018, uh, based out of the UNC Chapel Hill School of Public Health, that, you know, 88% of Americans were metabolically unhealthy. Now, three years later, we're really looking at statistics that are 92 to 93% of Americans are not metabolically well. And so when someone says to me, I like to snack, I always say, then you're not structuring your meals properly. And really the way to master metabolic health and physiology, you know, really supporting our bodies is to eat two to three larger meals, mm -hmm. then having a meal and then a snack two hours later and a meal and then a snack two hours later, because what's happening physiologically is that with each meal, depending on what it is, you know, there we have macronutrients, so protein, fat, and carbohydrates, understanding that fat has the most negligible impact on blood sugar, then protein, then carbohydrates. So that banana, if you're not a metabolically healthy individual, is going to dysregulate your blood sugar and increase your insulin and put you in the state where if your insulin levels are high in response to high blood sugar levels, you are not going to be able to break down stored fat as a fuel source. And that's an important understanding. I think we don't do a very good job. I say we as clinicians have really not done a stellar job educating our patients around this. Now, if you are Vlad, a very healthy individual, you know, I have very athletic teenagers, they can handle a piece of fruit in between their meals. It's not a big deal. But when we're looking at adults, I generally encourage them to be mindful of putting their meals together properly so they're not hungry in between. Okay. Hmm. That's, that's actually very helpful information. And so, so for, for example, uh, well, here, here's my question over here. How about in terms of calorie consumption? And I know, of course, it depends on how active you are, right? Uh, but let's just say someone who is, let's just say someone who's sedentary, so who lives a sedentary lifestyle, they work in an office, they sit mostly. Uh, how, what does that intermittent fasting uh, look like? They're, are they supposed to be consuming like 2000 calories or 18, anywhere from 1800 to 2200 calories in a, in a day? Well, I don't teach my patients to count calories. I teach them to count macros. And, and it's because, unfortunately, it's this very reductionistic thinking. And, and again, clinicians do a really terrible job educating our patients about this. Our bodies are more sophisticated than just counting calories. There's so much okay. more to it than calories. There's the hormones. You know, I've already mentioned several of them, you know, glucose, insulin, leptin, all these signaling hormones, it's important to understand that someone who's sedentary obviously is not as metabolically healthy as someone that is more physically active. So let's start there. I do encourage individuals, um, and, and most of the population that I work with are women. I see most women are eating too little protein, too many mm. of the wrong types of fats, and too many carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are not bad. It's the type and quality of carbohydrates that are important. So what I would say is even if you are a sedentary individual, there's a certain amount of discretionary protein for you every day that is going to be important. So when I'm teaching my patients, it's anywhere from 30 to 50 grams of protein per day per meal. So if you're having two meals, let's say you're having 100 grams of protein, that helps with satiety, that helps with maintaining muscle mass. There's a lot of very important qualifiers that I would put in there is that I don't mm -hmm. encourage people to count the calories. Focus on the macros. Make sure your protein threshold is at least 100 grams of protein a day. If you are not metabolically healthy, you've been told you're insulin resistant, you have PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, you're, you have metabolic syndrome, you're diabetic, et cetera, then your, pro, your carbohydrate threshold 
Average American is consuming 200 to 300 grams of carbohydrates a day. That includes the sugary soft drinks that people consume, the frappuccinos, the desserts, et cetera. That we really lower that carbohydrate threshold and get our carbohydrates from non-starchy vegetables, low glycemic fruits. And by mm. lowering that carbohydrate threshold under 100 grams a day, for a lot of people, that's very challenging that you will start to get the macros lined up. And then it's less about counting calories. I'm not saying calories don't matter. But if people start focusing in on nutrient density and they start looking at their macros differently, they will feel much more satiated. They won't be you know, wanting to run to the vending machine in the middle of the afternoon because they have an energy slump. They are going to have sustained energy between their meals. And I find for many people, that's the, the first like tipping point in terms of what is manageable. I think, I think many people are tired of counting calories. They know it doesn't work. Um, mm -hmm. There will always be someone out there who'll say, of course it works for me. And I'm like, that's great. But there's so much more to weight loss resistance than calorie counting and you know, getting very granular about every single bit of food you put in your mouth. So I say, if you track anything, track, the mac track your macros, especially protein and especially carbohydrates, and you will get much, much farther. Over the last year, 86.6% of our regular viewers have not yet hit the subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It's a small gesture on your end and a huge leap forward for our channel. If you wouldn't mind, we would love to ask you if you found our channel informative and engaging, if you can please hit that subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It allows us to go ahead and continue to put out great content, better guests, and as always, we will always put out two episodes per week. Thank you so much. You said 93% is metabolically unhealthy? Correct. That's how many, when you start looking, it's staggering. That's crazy. It is staggering how unhealthy Americans are. Why? How can we test if I, if, how do I know if I'm healthy or unhealthy? Well, I probably fall on the unhealthy ladder anyway. Maybe Vlad falls in that 7%, but <laughs> he's, he, <laughs> um, he's very athletic, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so why does this happen? So let me answer that question first. I think it's, it's our modern day lifestyles. We are increasingly sedentary. We don't sleep. High quality sleep is critically important to our health. Mm. And that is not five hours of sleep with, you know, binging Netflix and, you know, being woken up because your you know, neighbors are noisy. Um, the sleep quality, the, the not being physically active, it's, it's the hyper palatable, highly processed foods. I'm in the midst of reading a book called The Dorito Effect that had been recommended me for years and I'm finally getting around to reading it. And it's really talking about what food science has done that when we look at um, ingredients in, in a simple dish, like you grill a steak, you, you steam broccoli, you have a, a pat of butter on the broccoli and you add some salt, that's very different than the hyper palatable stuff that tricks our brains into thinking that we actually haven't eaten as much food as we have. And, and the, the modern, modern standard American diet is a really good example of this. As I mentioned earlier, we're eating too many carbohydrates and it's processed carbs, it's seed oils. It's these inflammatory rancid seed oils. So sunflower, safflower, soybean, canola, cottonseed. Um, if they're in your pantry, if you take nothing away from this conversation other than this, throw away the seed oils. The number one consumed fat in the United States is soybean oil. Soybean oil is a crime. It is a byproduct of highly refined solvents. If you, if you wanna dive down a rabbit hole, Google or go to YouTube and, and ask to see what canola oil looks like when it's being created. You will never want to consume it again. So I, I think it's many things. We know that, um, you know, Dr. Kate Shanahan's a great resource on this. She's a physician. She's a researcher really looking at the role of seed oils and how it drives carbohydrate addiction and leads to insulin resistance. Um, so movement, lack of sleep, food choices, it's meal frequency. I think this also is a huge contributor. I, I don't think many people understand that each time you're eating, you're you're secreting a degree of insulin to bring your blood sugar back down. But if we're chronically right. stressed and we're eating these hyperpalatable foods, that certainly is a, a huge contributor. I would say the other thing to really you know think about, and and this is based on research. This is an area of interest of mine. Um, when we talk about trauma and the role of trapped emotions in the body, trauma is a wound. And, you know, I, many years ago in my training, it was like trauma is a big T trauma. It's, you know, someone, someone, someone uh, committed suicide. You witnessed the death of, of a close loved one. Um, your parents had a terrible divorce. Trauma can be much more benign than that. It can be being mm. bullied or it could be perceptions of, you know, relationships gone wrong that can 
you know, lead to weight loss resistance and autoimmune conditions. So Vlad, to answer your question, I think all of the above definitely contributes. Um, how do we test? So I think there's many things to consider. You know, we, we talk about in like the lay public about being a carbohydrate burner or, or you know, someone that's it's metabolically flexible on the other extreme. We want our bodies to be able to utilize either carbohydrates or fat as a fuel source. We want to be flexible to be able to use both. Most people who are not metabolically flexible, they're stuck in this carbohydrate burning mode, which is why they have um, they're, they're chronically hungry. They get hangry. They are weight loss resistant. They have energy slumps. It's not normal to have an energy slump after a meal. And I think mm. so many people assume that that is normal. Like that's why they're going mm. to get the soda, the candy bar, the frappuccino at three o'clock because they ate a, a very large carbohydrate load for lunch with very little protein. How do we test for this? I think there's many biomarkers. The one that I, I really think is a gold standard and, and most providers aren't per se ordering is a fasting insulin. It is inexpensive. And it is oftentimes the very first biomarker that will dysregulate in response to metabolic health changes. Obviously fasting glucose and A1C, I don't order as many of them, uric acid. Um, uric acid is a, I think a lot of people associate it with gout. Um, again, there's a lot of mm. research talking about when your uric acid levels start going up, it's a metabolic health marker. I think about high sensitivity CRP. I think about triglycerides. I think about HDL. Um, I think about blood pressure. You know, hypertension or high blood pressure is something that is mediated by insulin resistance. A lot of these insulin resistance um, diagnoses uh, are, are, you know, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, a lot of these neurocognitive disorders that we don't necessarily associate with being insulin resistant and being not metabolically flexible. So that's certainly a starting point. Um, you know, those, those, many of these things are fixable, um, not per se, by the time you get a, di a diagnosis of Alzheimer's, that's different, but polycystic ovarian syndrome, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, insulin resistance are all things that are reversible. And so a lot of it is with that lifestyle piece. But I think fasting insulin is the gold standard. It's inexpensive. It's covered by insurance. It is not a functional medicine test. That is usually a really good starting point. I do mine quarterly. And so I have a really good sense of mm. you know where I am. Mine doesn't deviate much, but I can okay. watch my patients. Sometimes they'll say I'm weight loss resistant. I don't know why. And we draw fasting insulin and it's 20. And I'm like, okay, well, we've got a starting point to work, work from. This is a topic that is very near and dear to me because just to give you some background context and may, perhaps from the, I don't know exactly, uh, which, which, I'm sorry, I don't know, which, which state are you from? Or I, I live in Virginia. Mm -hmm. Okay, you live in Virginia. So my, uh, my parents are from Bangladesh. Uh, we come from the South, South Asian or South, South Asian community. And I don't even know what the percent is, <laughs> like 99%? <laughs> don't quote me, but uh, of our parents have diabetes, high blood pressure, hypertension, diabetes, diabetes, diabetes. And that's because I know because we consume an insane amount of carbohydrates. We eat rice for lunch. We eat rice for dinner. This was back when I was growing up. My mom would force feed it to us. My mom has diabetes. My All my aunts have diabetes. Any of my friends' parents, I'm telling 99% of them have diabetes paired with hypertension. Now, something very important that you mentioned, you, you did say that diabetes or pre-diabetes is potentially reversible. I'd love to spend some time talking a little bit about this. Let's, 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 let's take it a little bit personally. Let's say, what can I, uh, Cynthia, what can I tell my mom? First of all, she won't listen to me, but I think that's the bigger part of the problem, <laughs> right? Aside from getting, getting, the, getting your incredible workbook behind you, which I see, I mean, what, what's the starting point here? What do we do to fix this issue? It's already on the cover of the book. This is what you have to eat instead of the rice. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but I think it's also like starting the conversation and saying that there's this thrifty genotype. So we know South Asians are at greater risk. They can be thinner and be at greater risk for diabetes and insulin resistance. So um, just that awareness, I think, is very important. When I'm talking to women... It's helping them understand that we are largely in many ways protected from insulin resistance until we go into perimenopause and menopause. So okay. I don't know how old your mom is, but um, in and of itself, menopause is a de facto disease state. And, and that is becoming an increasingly normal way to think about it. It's not that it's a, well, it isn't a positive thing, but there are ways to work around it. So 
uh, first and foremost, I want to make sure your mom is sleeping through the night because sleep is foundational to our health, making sure she's properly hydrated, because if you are dehydrated, it'll make it more challenging to be able Mm -hmm. to maintain certain physiologic processes. I also think about meal frequency. So most of us benefit from eating less frequently. So, you know, maybe mom eats dinner at six o'clock at night and eats breakfast at seven, even delaying breakfast by one hour and breakfast is really breaking your fast. So I want everyone to think about, you can break your fast Mm. at any time during the day, delaying food onset or food consumption by even an hour after awakening has profound physiologic benefits. Um, If you're going to have carbohydrates, make sure they're never naked. So you want to make sure if you're having protein, you want to have protein with the carbohydrate. I always say protein is the consistency with every meal. And depending on how physically active you are, maybe that's the day you have a little more carb, or maybe that's the day instead you have um, a, like I'm just giving an example, a filet is lean, a lean piece of meat versus a ribeye is going to be a fatty piece of meat with a lot of marbling, but helping people understand that lean proteins especially if you're weight loss resistant or insulin resistant is going to be of greater benefit and value because I'd rather that you get the rest of your discretionary food intake from non-starchy vegetables. Vegetables are important and it's not to suggest that rice per se is bad, but if you're eating copious amounts of rice and yeah. you're eating a lot of carbohydrate, starchy carbohydrate later in the day, we are more physiologically insulin resistant earlier in the day When it's Mm. light outside, we tend to be more physically active. We also tend to be more insulin sensitive. And then as it starts getting darker out, our body is secreting more melatonin, is hopefully suppressing some cortisol to get us ready for bed. And what can happen is people eat a large bolus of carbohydrates with nothing else before bed, and you're just sending your blood sugar into a free fall. So understanding that eating less often can be helpful, making sure you're eating enough protein, I would say the other thing is even something as easy as 15 minutes of walking after a meal we know has Mm -hmm. a huge impact on blood sugar regulation and it's cheap. There's no fancy gadgets. I'm not saying everyone has to run out and get an R ring. What I'm suggesting, or even a a CGM continuous glucose monitor. Um, Another thing that I think can be helpful is, is a, a glucometer. They tend to be fairly inexpensive. And I say fairly inexpensive, depending on where you live. Um, The awareness of, the, your blood sugars um, effects related to stress, sleep quality, nutritional choices, exercise, whether you do it or don't, can be really profound. But I would probably start with foundational principles, kind of like I mentioned, because I think they're so they're so valuable. Inevitably, it always comes up. Well, do you think HRT or hormone replacement therapy mm. can help with insulin resistance? Yes, but. First, we have to work on the foundational stuff so that we are in a position to be able to layer that in later. But I, but I do think it can be challenging when culturally, if you eat a lot of starchy food and that's a part of the, of your culture and your heritage, it makes it more challenging to say, Hey mom, you've been doing this for 50, 60 years. Now I want you to course correct. Um, That can be really challenging for people. I, I know with my parents. Um, when I make suggestions to them, sometimes it just falls on deaf ears because they're like, listen, I've been doing this for a long time and I don't want to change, but I'm willing to run the risk of being insulin resistant, but I don't want to change. And so it, there, there has to, it has to always come from a place of education. I always say there's no judgment. Mm, it's just right. let me introduce you to some information that may be of value to you in terms of your metabolic health. And I'm sorry, quick clarification on the point of walking for 15 minutes right after you eat. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you explain briefly? So what, what, what is the benefit of that? And should it be right after eating or is it fine if it's like 60 minutes afterwards? And, um, and, and, would... and is it is it after each each meal or is it just in the morning or in the evening? Uh, I think so. If you're insulin resistant, that was the context. Um, if you're okay. insulin resistant or diabetic, I think you should be walking after every meal because every time that muscle contracts, it's using glucose. It's using, um, mm-hmm. it's helping to okay. lower and buffer your blood sugar. And so, you know, that, that skeletal muscle movement. And and if I haven't already suggested this, I want everyone to think about skeletal muscle as this glucose disposal unit. You want to maintain it. You want to build it. You don't want to lose it because as you lose muscle, which is something called sarcopenia, it's not a question of if, but when, and it really accelerates Mm. after 40 for everyone. Um, this is when people start struggling with more insulin resistance. So if you are insulin resistant, uh, walking after every meal would be a benefit. If you're not, I mean, I usually walk in the morning and the evening because we have dogs, but I especially like to do it after dinner because sometimes that can be depending on what day of the week. 
Sometimes that is my largest meal of the day, although not generally. And it's just a good way to, you know, get your digestion moving and to, you know, ensure you've got good lymphatic, you know, blood flow and using up that, that blood sugar, you know, making sure you're buffering that blood sugar response. And if you have a glucometer or if you have a continuous glucose monitor, you'll see an improvement. I mean, even myself, mm -hmm. if my blood sugar's 90 after a meal, after I walk for 15 or 20 minutes, it's definitely going to be in the low eighties, if not high seventies. And so wow. I, I think that it's, it's a helpful exercise for people to understand. There's also a new concept that I was introduced to that I'll share. Cause I think for someone that says, well, it's not realistic for me to walk after a meal. There's something called a soleus pushup, which is as simple as you know, you're seated at a desk like I am right now, and you just flex at your ankle and your soleus muscles on the back of your calf. And so that alone, that pumping action can actually use, you know, can help with, you know, in preserving some degree of insulin sensitivity. And there's research going on in this area, um, which I found fascinating because I'm always hearing from patients that say it's not realistic. I'm not going to be able to walk three times a day, but I can do a soleus pushup at my desk or when I'm, you know, commuting into work on a subway or I'm in a cab or an Uber or whatever it is that you're doing or on a plane, you can definitely be doing that exercise and know that that is going to help with improving blood sugar control. And what is that? That is just flexing your... Yeah, you literally just flex at your ankle. So your soleus muscle is your calf muscle okay. and all you're doing okay. is just flexing up and down. So really easy and no one has to know you're doing it. Wow. Okay. Oh, and I, and I found great, his, his ideal great. exercise right now. <laughs> My ideal, like, well, you know, I, I did, I do have the aura ring. So I've been, I've been, and I've been walking five miles a day. Uh, but it, 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 it's funny that we're talking about this because Vlad, I don't know if you know this, but it's actually really hard to get a solid eight hours of sleep. Like today I was in bed. It showed that I was in bed for n nearly nine hours, but according to this ring, I wasn't asleep for eight. It was like, seven hours and 10 oh, this minutes. Is, this so is actually a question. How long should be the sleep? Eight hours or less? If you look at the research, yeah, you know, seven to eight hours. And obviously there are outliers. Like I always have a few women that will tell me they can get by with six and a half hours. I'm not one of them. Um, but if you look at the research, generally speaking, seven to eight hours is ideal. And you're looking for, if you have an aura or a whoop band, you can look to see what's your breakdown of your REM and your deep sleep. And I always remind people you want at least 90 minutes of both. What I see a lot of people in my kind of age range struggling with is deep sleep. And so a lot of why we don't sleep well is self-induced. You know, we are on tablets, devices, blue light, watching TV, you know, we're stressed and on our computers in bed. Um, you know, we're exposed to all this blue light, which will suppress that, that hormone melatonin and tells our bodies it's not time to go to bed. It's time to get up and start moving around. So a lot of sleep hygiene uh, is important and to be thinking about when you wake up in the morning to be thinking about your sleep quality. So I take a walk outside without sunglasses with my dogs for anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes every morning. And that reminds my body it's time to suppress melatonin. It's time to increase cortisol. We have receptors in our retina and start our eye that are kind of acute are, are very intrinsically related to this, this internal clock, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the SCN. And so it's a, it's kind of like our master internal clock and it's reminding our bodies it's time to get up and get moving, but understanding that that action in the morning impacts your sleep quality at night. So I always mm. encourage people mm. to think about sleep when they wake up and not five minutes before they go to bed. And then they'll generally have much greater success. And, you know, the other piece I would add to that is don't eat to, within two hours of going to bed. I know when I was in college, I did that all the time. As I've gotten older, I realize I actually do much better yeah. ending, you know, kind of closing my feeding window earlier. And we know, again, based on the, you know, this, this chronobiology, you know, this internal clocks that we have clocks actually in our digestive system. So if you eat a big bolus of food an hour before bed and you wonder why your sleep quality is really poor, that can be a big reason why. Hmm. You know, I want to clarify one thing about the morning. You said the breakfast is not so important as we were taught. So after I wake up, what's the period between my my waking up period and the breakfast? And what should I eat on my for, for my breakfast? Should it start maybe with the with, with with a cup of water, with the lemon water or the juice or something like this? No, I, I love, I love this question. So I would say hydration is key. You know, you haven't consumed any, any hydration overnight. So water with lemon, I think is great. Um, I, I think that there's really this, this hour or two buffer from the time that you wake up until 
you know, your body, there, there's this, these counter regulatory mechanisms that are designed to suppress hunger. Rarely, unless you're a, like my teenagers, you know, they, they wake up hungry because they're just in this massive anabolic growth phase. So if you can delay eating food for an hour or two after waking up, you can have green tea, you can have black tea, you can have black coffee, all of these things send valuable information to our body. So bitter is important. Bitter is a sign of high polyphenol uh, count and polyphenols are plant-based compounds that help with fat oxidation. They give valuable information to our body. Mm. So hydration, maybe if you enjoy it, bitter tea or plain coffee. And then when you're putting meals together, really thinking thoughtfully about having protein. So whether or not it's you sit down and have eggs, bacon, um, sausage, maybe you have leftovers from the night before. I tell people like, don't make it complicated. Um, protein is really the, what you want to focus on. Now, if you decide that you want to have protein and, and today you're going to have, maybe you have some avocado toast. So you're still having a little bit of fat and a little bit of carbohydrate, but maybe it's on sourdough bread, which we know has some intrinsic properties that differentiate it from regular, um, dwarf free hybrid hybridized bread or wheat that's here in the United States. I think that's perfectly fine. But really, again, the satiating point is that 30 to 50 grams of protein in that meal. And if you have, you know, three or four eggs, I don't know how many eggs you all eat. I, my threshold's about five is my max, whether you have an omelet, per, bacon, that, sausage, no, in a meal, um, five yeah. is about as much as I can eat. I, I think I eat five a week, maybe even less. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love I love eggs, but eggs are, are something I really enjoy. I like the choline. There's just a lot of benefits and it's something my body likes. Like this is where bioindividuality is important, but you could have leftover steak, you could have a piece of chicken, you could have a piece of fish. I mean, the the kind of thoughts are endless, but here in the United States, we have this I don't know. I, I know where it stems from, you know, from the processed food industry, but we're convinced we need to have cornflakes and bread and lots mm. of carbohydrate dense foods, pop tarts. And that does not set us up for success. That does not stabilize our blood sugar. That does not allow us to go from breakfast to lunch without being hungry in between or having an energy slump. And so what do most Americans do? They sit down and have their cornflakes with their skim milk and a glass of orange juice. And then an hour later, they have a Pop-Tart or maybe a granola bar. I mean, they're just on the sugar roller coaster and they're never setting themselves up for success. So protein, 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 giving yourself an hour or two after you wake up to eat and I, I feel like for a lot of people, that in and of itself can be life changing. Mm. And what about I, the gluten? Yeah, I agree. What about the gluten? Well, <laughs> it isn't so much gluten as much as what's done to the wheat that is problematic. Uh, and, and your listeners may travel outside the United States and realize, oh, when I travel to the EU or I'm outside the United States, I don't feel bad when I eat gluten or eat mm. uh, bread yeah. or a croissant or whatever. Um, but here in the United States, there is this hybridized product, a dwarf wheat, but it is sprayed with a, a, an herbicide and pesticide. Um, it's called Roundup. And what this product does, glyphosate, is it punches holes in our small intestine. So literally our small intestinal lining is one cell layer thick. So it's very fragile. And what this does is it punches holes in the small intestine. So for many, many people, they will develop in response to this. Some people never experience symptoms. But many people actually will develop something called non-celiac gluten hypersensitivity. And so this means they do not have celiac, but they have bloating. They develop autoimmune conditions. I'm very sensitive to gluten. So when you ask me, what do I think of gluten? I would say it's very bio-individual. But mm. I feel like most people eat too much processed carbs instead of eating the real carbohydrates. Like if you said to me, Cynthia, I really like having fruit in the morning, I would say, great. Have a piece of fruit because it's got fiber. There's a lot in there that will slow down the absorption of that food versus if you sit down and have cornflakes, a pop tart, right. a piece of bread with butter on it, or just a plain piece of bread, uh, you know, something that's been milled into flour will, uh, will hit your bloodstream a whole lot faster. And we know sugar mm -hmm. or, you know, starchy things that are broken down can be as excitatory in the brain as illicit drugs. And this is why mm -hmm. I tell people whether it's sugar or, um, you know, gluten-free flour, whatever it is for a lot of people, it's a very slippery slope. So I think you have to know yourself. Like there are specific things I can't moderate. So I don't, I don't eat them. I eliminate them. There are other things I can moderate. And so it's not a problem to have them. But if you're someone that struggles and says, if I have one donut, I have five, or if I have one piece of toast, I have half a loaf, that might be a sign that you need to 
eliminate that food and maybe find something else that satisfies that craving or that desire without undermining your health. Mm. All I, all I can think about right now is running to my pantry and seeing if I have how many things are in my pantry with seed oils. <laughs> uh, probably quite a bit. I'm not even going to lie, Cynthia. I'd love to take some time to talk about the book behind you uh, that you've published. It was 2022, correct? Yes. Last year. Uh, please, can you talk to us a little bit about that? I, I know it's a 45-day regimen. This book is, of course, towards women. Uh, what can readers uh, expect? Uh, to read and understand in this book. Yeah, thank you. So it's a book that's designed for women uh, out of that viral TEDx that came out of 2019. So I always say it was never intention to just focus on women. That's just the way that, that life happened. <laughs> but it provides the science and the things that I have seen work clinically for women, being mindful of your menstrual cycle, being mindful of what life stage a woman is, whether it's your peak fertile years under the age of 35, perimenopause, the 10 to 15 years preceding menopause and menopause, which is 12 months without a menstrual cycle. And here in the US, the average age is 51. Um, being mindful of those timeframes and the role of lifestyle, like if but nothing else, sleep, stress, nutrition, exercise are all very, very important, especially for women, but understanding the net impact on your success as it pertains to fasting. I always say fasting is but one strategy that women can kind of embrace. And the 45 days kind of walks, walks women through a program that I created that allows people over a 45 day period to have success. Even if you've been fasting for a long time, there's always some nuance or some lever that we can push to improve the success that you're having. So it's designed with that in, in mind, as well as over 50 recipes created by the very talented Beth Lipton, focused in mm -hmm. on protein, um, you know, not anti-carb. Uh, unfortunately, I think a lot of people associate intermittent fasting with low carb. It's not always the case. Um, I do think people need to be mindful of carbohydrates, especially if they're weight loss resistant. And then using a lot of healthy fats um, and helping people get introduced to new proteins, which I think is also very important. No, that's incredible. I, I will definitely pick up a copy from my parents, actually. My entire community needs this. Uh, including me. I'm sure that that book has tons of don't, don't try to change them. Well. Just buy it for but. yourself. <laughs> <laughs> just, all right. I'll, you know what? I'm just going to buy it for myself. But now I do want to ask you a flip side of the question to it. I, I kind of have to uh, uh, throw a wrench here. Maybe, maybe not. But so over here. So this is something that we've seen. Uh, there's a new study that came out in 2022 from the New England Journal of Medicine. Now, I, I, I briefly read this. It's called calorie restriction with or without time restricted eating in weight loss. So IF versus without. And their conclusion basically was they didn't really find that eating in a time restricted way help people lose more weight than just cutting back on calories. Now, I did take a look into the sample size. It really wasn't a lot, but it did make mm -hmm. it way, make its way into the New England Journal of Medicine. So is intermittent fasting is it hyped or not really? Or can you speak to anything about this, uh, that, that the study that came out in 2022? Well, it, it's ironic that you bring this up because it's my first question was, if it's the study that I, that I've talked about, the very small sample size for listeners, you want a sample size of at least an N of 100. So at least a hundred participants. Um, if I recall, they weren't being particularly mindful of what people were consuming in terms of food intake, which is also obviously very relevant. Um, I, I don't think they used a, a broad sample size of age ranges, which I think also contributes. Mm. Anytime you see research, and yes, this is actually a, a good, generally a good journal, um, you want to see who is who is paid for the research. So uh, mm. ultimately, the processed food industry will lose if people are eating less often, leading, le eating less frequently. So you have to think about um, many variables and, you know, small sample size. So that in and of itself, it, it allows us to kind of say, Hey, this is something we need to, to delve more into. Um, but irrespective of that fact, I think about what are people eating in their feeding window it, the, for the people that were doing time restricted eating. Um, if I recall, I, I don't, if I recall properly and, and because I, because there were, there are always many studies that are ongoing throughout the year. It's like, sometimes I'm trying to, to remember um, particular things about this. I'm trying to remember if th these were individuals that were exercising or not on top of this, you know, mm. um, caloric restriction versus time restricted eating. Um, the other piece to really think about is that when we're just restricting calories, 
we're not understanding that there are a lot of benefits that come from fasting that are not just about caloric restriction. So right. the, the concept of autophagy, this waste and recycling process that goes on, helping people understand that when we're in an unfed state, our body actually goes in and gets rid of disease, disordered organelles, mitochondria, things that have the potential for going on to create disease. And so this is one of those characteristics that people that are that are anti-fasting very rarely will talk about. Um, mm. You know, we get upregulation up in autophagy the longer we are fasting. So are you getting any autophagy at 12 hours? Very likely, not a whole lot. We know it really starts to pick up when you're getting closer to 18, 20, 24 plus hours. But that doesn't mean there aren't still intrinsic benefits. And I, I think for a lot of individuals, it's really looking carefully at our habits um, you know, if someone's just counting calories, they're missing, they're missing the forest through the trees. They're, they're not understanding that the macros piece to me is, is so important. We, we have gotten so focused on this weight loss culture that we're willing to do whatever it takes to lose weight, but we mm -hmm. forget that first and foremost, we need to nourish our bodies. So when we have a, sam a small sample size and we're looking at studies, I always say I'm always open-minded. I'm like, you know, prove me wrong or show yeah. me the research that suggests otherwise. But I think it still remains to be seen. Obviously, there's not enough research done on women. Most of it's been done mm. on lab animals and mm. extrapolated to humans, or it's done on obese menopausal women or men. And so I think that the the jury is still out there. There's certainly things I've seen clinically. Um, and, and, you know, anecdotal evidence is still valuable from the perspective of that's what allowed me to... Right you know, write the book and be able to speak from a, a, a place of um, authenticity. But I think it just really speaks to the fact there's always someone who doesn't want fasting to, um, to be <laughs> considered to be the norm, right? I mean, the processed right, food right industry now, would yeah. be the big losers. Yes. And when I always look at sponsored research, the question is always who benefits from saying that fasting isn't effective. A hundred percent. Well, that's a, that's a topic we can spend a long time, but <laughs> on each study, can we see who is the sponsor of the study or no? Sometimes you can, you just can't, usually you're looking at the, the, like the very end of the study. It, it's supposed to disclose to you, mm, you know, who, who has sponsored the research. And, and let's be clear, like there's industry sponsored research all the time. I mean, I, I, as a good example, when I was practicing in clinical cardiology, uh, you know, the drug reps, very well-meaning, they had a job to do. I was always polite, but their job was to prove that their drug was effective. Right. You know, it was mm. not to prove that their job was, their drug was right. ineffective. And so I would always ask who sponsored the right. study. Of course, I knew the answer. It was almost like rhetorical. And they would say, oh, right. well, you know, you know, it was a double blinded placebo randomized controlled study. And I'm like, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so something to definitely consider when you're looking at research. Definitely. No, I love that. What, what about the uh, juicing, juicing fasting? So I do, I do talk about this. So, so juicing, um, when it's predominantly green vegetables is different than juice. Like when I think about juice, like I don't buy juice in my house and my kids would love if I would just buy a carton of orange juice. The issues I have with traditional fruit juice, let me start there, okay. is that more often than not, you are absorbing a lot of carbohydrates and sugar, as opposed to if you sat down and you said, Cynthia, I love eating oranges. I would say, eat the orange because you're going to get fiber. It's going to take time to, to peel it versus you sit down and drink, I don't know, right. 40, 50 grams of sugar um, right. and a lot of carbohydrates. And your body has to process that all at once. It's like mainlining sugar right into your bloodstream versus there are a lot of people that like vegetable juice, whether it's celery, spinach, kale, God bless them. If they like doing that, that's great. It's very earthy. No, no, I'm serious. We, our palates are conditioned for sweetness. So yeah. what happens is, is more often than not, if you have a cold pressed juice, maybe you have a, a place in your neighborhood that they make organic cold pressed juice. I would say if you enjoy that every once in a while, that's great. Um, should that be the basis of, of what you're eating day to day? It would get expensive um, to do that. But if it's predominantly green juices, Probably okay. I have a friend who loves celery juice. That's her thing. Um, it's just not something that my digestive system would like me to do. I do better chewing and swallowing my food. But I think mm. every once in a while, you know, doing, uh, you know, green juices, I think is fine if you tolerate that. If you're sensitive to oxalates, that might be problematic. But to do traditional fruit juicing, 
that can be a slippery slope. Um, you know, I think it's probably something to enjoy as a treat, but you know, most conventional stuff that we see in a grocery store has been put underneath high pressure. A lot of the intrinsic properties of the juices have been destroyed. The enzymatic activity, that's why you want cold pressed juice. And I do have mm -hmm. a, a colleague who has a, a company that, that she, that she recommend that she owns. And I've learned a lot through her what to look for in a, in a store. Like I know whole foods sometimes will make their own products in store, or there might be a local juicery near you that, that you can get those products from. Yeah. Bef before, before I move on to my next question, I want to ask a question about your book. Um, so in your, in your book, you have 45 days. Does it include the recipes for every day? What do you have to do? Um, so yes, um, although we were required by, um, by my publisher that we had to break it down by this is the serving size. And one of the things that we've gotten a lot of questions about it, well, if I do the serving size, then I'm, I'm actually not eating enough protein. I just say, just double it. But we had to do that so we could put down the nutritional information because that was mm. what was required. Yes, you could do it that way. You could also, as long as you're following the, my philosophy of aiming for 100 grams of protein a day, you could also just kind of weigh and kind of track out your macros over the course of a week. I always say 100 grams of protein a day minimum. That's what you're aiming for. No more than 30 grams of protein per meal. And that's a, mm -hmm. like, once people understand, like that's, that's, you know, it could be a lot of dark leafy vegetables and not a whole lot of like beans, legumes, rice, um, things like that. Those portions add up pretty quickly, but that's about as much carbohydrate as I think most people do well with. They can manage that. They can mitigate that versus a hundred grams of carbohydrate. You're going to feel like crap and you're probably going to get tired and want to go take a nap or, you know, indulge in the Frappuccino candy bar croissant mm -hmm. in the afternoon thinking that's going to perk you up you know what tomorrow i'm going to actually detail and check out my macros because i have not been doing that i'm i it's kind of, i'm one of those people that like when i when i decide to be healthier i just do calorie in calorie out uh i mean obviously i do consume more protein because uh, i think it's also a men thing when men go on fasting it's like protein 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 mm -hmm. shake protein this egg whites right uh, but I definitely don't have a breakdown of my macronutrients, so I, I will definitely do that starting tomorrow. Yeah. And, do you want to know my, my favorite macro counter? I have no affiliation yeah, please, with them, so please. let me just chronometer. So chronometer has a free app and they do macros and micros. So you can actually see if you're deficient in potassium or magnesium uh, in your diet. And, and I've just found that that's been a great resource for people because it gives them a little bit of extra information. Incredible. No, thank you so much for that. I will literally download that as soon as we're done <laughs> with the podcast. <laughs> oh, I love that. Uh, uh, go ahead, Vlad. Yeah, let's speak about the uh, different fasting protocols. So I know there is big debates about it. There are a lot of different ones like FAF2 diet, restricted, uh, time-restricted diets. And there is also, I mean, di different debates about it. So that includes also the weight loss, metabolic health, and overall well-being. So could you please talk about which one is the best and what's your thoughts on this? Yeah. So I think like as a starting place, I think a 16, eight, 16 hours fast with an eight hour feeding window is a good starting point for a lot of people. It's like, oh my gosh, it blows their mind. I'm, I'm eating, you know, 10 times a day. And now you're asking me to eat two or three times in an eight hour feeding window. So that's a good metric to work towards. I think about OMAD, I think about, um, you know, 5-2 or 30-16, which are, all these are just variations of a, of a similar theme. OMAD is one meal a day. I don't like this as a sustained strategy because you'll never get enough protein in. And I see a mm -hmm. lot of very sarcopenic looking men and women walking around. They're like, you know, they're so proud of themselves. I'm virtuous. I only eat one meal a day. Well, guess mm -hmm. what? <laughs> you're you're going to set your muscles up to just atrophy because your body's just breaking breaking down muscle um, in response to this lack of protein in your diet. So OMAD is fine. Like, let's say you go on vacation, you, you've eaten too much, you come home, you're like, I'm not really hungry. I'm just going to eat one meal and kind of get back right. on track the following day. Uh, you know, I, I think about a 30 slash 16, so 30 hours fasted with a 16 hour. You know, it's like you have these alternating time periods of fasting and eating. Um, those are great for plateau busting, meaning someone's gotten some initial changes in body composition, weight loss, and then maybe a couple months later, the scale is stuck and they're trying to, you know, they're trying to, to, to kind of move the needle. This is a time when we want to change macros. We want to look at what we're doing in the gym. We want to think about changing up those feeding and fasting windows. 
The challenge for me, and I want to be really transparent about this, when someone has weight to lose, I don't mind doing longer fasts. If someone is at a goal weight, they're healthy at the weight they're at, I don't love doing these prolonged fasts. So 24 hours mm -hmm. worth of fasting is about as much as I will do. I'm lean. I'm not a big person. I don't want to lose any of the muscle that I have. And so a lot of, of us in the metabolic health space have started to speak up about this more often, that these really long fasts that people want to do for days on end that are already thin and lean, probably not a good idea. However, there can be specific types of longer fasts for different reasons. Sometimes you want to do a two-day fast for digestive rest. Sometimes you want to do a three to five day fast because you're looking to impact stem cells. You're looking to impact telomere length. These are you know, key markers mm. of aging. Um, we know based on research that sometimes those longer fasts can be helpful for, from an anti-aging perspective. Again, if you look at a lot of the anti-aging researchers, and I respect them enormously, they look sarcopenic. They look very thin. They're eating one meal a day. They're going, you know, every quarter, every month, they're doing three to five days of fasting. This is not aligned with the way that I think that you really, once you hit that goal weight, you do not want to be doing long, prolonged periods of fasting. You want to make sure you're eating enough and, you know, closing that feeding window. So I think that the type of fasting you select is really based on what are your goals what are you trying to do? Like if someone has an autoimmune condition um, and once you've had one, you're more prone to others, um, you know, those individuals may do, may do well having maybe a two to three day fast every so often, depending on how stable their autoimmune disease is. I think that it's important and it's critically important to identify, like if you are already thin, already lean, the over fasting is not going to, is not going to confer greater benefits. You're going to put yourself at risk for losing skeletal muscle mass. And as I kind of started the conversation saying, muscle is this organ of longevity. It is mm -hmm. also this organ of understanding that muscles are a glucose reservoir. So we want to treat them tenderly and we want to make sure that we preserve lean muscle. That is super important. No, e Cynthia. everything, everything so yeah, sounds so hard because you have to choose this, that, everything, you know? <laughs> You I don't want it to be hard. I, you I don't want it to be need hard. You need the coach, coach along alongside you, so they can guide you step by step. Because by yourself is just crazy. Because one day you need this one in one month or two months, you can change your body, can change, and you have to move to another regime or something. Mm -hmm. That's really not simple. Well, uh, <laughs> well, on the flip side, for for those who are listening, who also may not have the financial means to to go out and do that, which many, many, many of us don't, if we take a look at statistically, just make one change, right? Uh, just build up those habits, like micro habits. Uh, it's, just pick one thing. You can start off fasting. You don't even have to do a, a, a what is it, 16, 8 uh, a, 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 hour window. I mean, start off with, I don't know, right? You start off with a 10 hour eating window or 12 hour if you really need to. Then next week, reduce it to nine and then eight, right? I mean, it's, it's something like that, something yeah, stop, easy. Stop like, it in McDonald's and something fries. manageable. Yeah, no, no, I think that, you know, I'm all about meeting people where they are. And, you know, considering that I've taken care of patients for 25 years, the one thing I've learned is small habits add up. So if yeah. you're listening and you're like, I don't even know where to start, I would say right. if you do nothing else, stop snacking. Like stopping snacking is going to blow your mind. Same applies but for it's kids. Gonna force you. Uh, well, so, so this is sometimes I... I have to explain myself. My teenagers do not need to snack. They're growing, but if they if they're eating the right amount of food, they're not hungry in between meals. Mm. Um, I think when you have little kids who can't really regulate, you know, if parents are doing a good job of, you know, giving them plenty of protein and the right types of carbs and healthy fats, um, they're growing. And so I, I this is where I, I don't I don't like to. I don't ever like to say, I was like, I'm, I'm not the parent of everyone. I'm just parent. I'm just the parent of two individuals. And I know when they were younger, they did have some snacking, but they were also like rambunctious, busy, right. athletic little boys. As they got older, no snacking because they, they understood like, if I eat enough in my meal, I'm not going to be hungry in between. So stopping snacking for a lot of people is the hardest thing they're going to do. Because we've conditioned our patients to eat to stoke our metabolism when in essence that is contributing to varying degrees of uh, blood sugar dysregulation. So when you stop snacking, and I promise if you follow what I'm suggesting, stop snacking, it will force you to eat enough protein in your meal. 
Mm-hmm. And if and if you do nothing else, 30 to 50 grams of protein in a meal, you're going to be satiated enough. You're not going over time. You will not be hungry in between meals. So I think that's a good first step. And I like what you said about maybe you have a, maybe you just do 12 hours of digestive rest. You know, you don't eat from, don't eat after dinner and then don't eat again until you wake up. And for a lot of people, that's another kind of life shave, life, you know, saving tip is to just understand you are not going to die. We've convinced a lot of people they're going to die if they don't eat all the time. Right. You're not going to die. It, yeah. you pl- all of us have plenty of stored fat. We really won't. Even thin people have plenty of stored fat. Your body will get to a point mm. where it'll become more efficient. It'll be able to free up stored fat as a fuel source. So you, I promise you will not starve. Promise. Cynthia, it's been an absolute pleasure. I want to ask you one last question mm. before you go. Who has been the strongest or most inspiring person in your life and what lessons have you learned from them? Oh gosh. Um, you know, I think the honest answer, and, and this is after just coming home from a family wedding this past weekend, I would say without a doubt, um, probably my husband, I mean, we've been together for over 21 years, but you know, he's been on this wild journey with me. And, uh, when I started having ideas about wanting to pivot and leave clinical medicine and all the crazy ideas I would talk to him about, like, I really want to talk about metabolic health. I want to talk about fasting as this incredible strategy. He's been there a hundred percent, never told me I was crazy, even though I thought I was. Um, <laughs> but I, I would say in terms of like my modern day lifestyle, absolutely my husband, because um, mm. if you don't have enough support, whether it's your, your family, whether it's your married into family, it can make things a whole lot more challenging. So having support from someone that you love makes a really big difference. Wow, Cynthia, it has been, again, an absolute pleasure getting to speak with you. Time flew by. It was a lot of incredible advice that was given. And for those of you who are listening, of course, there has been no medical advice provided here. Just want to clarify that. Uh, thank you very much, of course, for the uh, the app recommendation. I'm going to go ahead and <laughs> download that as soon as we go ahead and end this. Uh, Cynthia, please let our listeners know, uh, where can they find more uh, about you, it, 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 whether it's a website or social platform? Thank you. It's been a pleasure. So probably easiest to start with my website, www.cynthiatherlow.com. You can get access to my two TED Talks, my podcast, Everyday Wellness, which, as I stated to the guys earlier, is one of my favorite ways to network within the health and wellness community. I am on Instagram. Be forewarned. If you find me on Twitter, I can be a little snarky. And I have a free Facebook group for men and women on Facebook called Intermittent Fasting Lifestyle backslash my name. All are welcome. It is an anti-drama environment. Awesome. Cynthia, thank you so much. Thank you.